I'm not here and this isn't happening. Like a dream within a dream, this film is merely a projection within a projection, an illusion within an illusion. And like the ounce of gold that seems to take on the appearance of a necklace or seems to appear as a bracelet, what we perceive to be our physical world only appears to be real when in fact it is not. And surprisingly enough, this has been scientifically proven, peer-reviewed, independently verified and published. And while this may seem like the stuff of science fiction novels and Hollywood blockbuster movies, it's absolutely true. Now to the rational mind, this may seem to go against everything we've ever understood. But isn't there a part of you that intuitively knows that there's a limit to human reasoning? That the human mind can only take us so far? Knowledge is only gained through experience. And so if we're going to experience the absolute truth in order to gain the ultimate knowledge, we need to be able to transcend our intellects and move beyond reason. Since the dawn of mankind, humans have always had an insatiable thirst for knowledge, for the truth. Why do the seasons change? How to start a fire? How to grow food? Why do we age? Why do the sun, moon, and stars rove around the sky? Where do we come from? How to cure people when they're sick? What's the meaning of life? And what happens after death? As our ancestors learned things, they devised ways of recording this wisdom and passing it down to future generations so as not to lose this valuable information. Science is the process of discovering and cataloging this knowledge. The word science comes from the Latin word scient, to know, as in omniscient, or all-knowing. And the meaning of the word science is simply a way of acquiring and accumulating knowledge. Over the past few thousand years, there have been many different legitimate schools of science. Sophistic science, esoteric science, Socratic science, theoretical science, Vedic science, Platonic science, and so forth. However, through the European Middle Ages up until around the 17th century, a schism formed and grew between the church and the scientific community due to the fact that the Vatican would only endure scientific discoveries that didn't conflict with their official doctrine. Those who presented scientific theories or discoveries that challenged the church's authorities were persecuted as heretics. Ultimately, some 400 years ago, the rift between the church and the scientists became so great that people such as Sir Francis Bacon, Galileo, and others were able to break free from the grip the church had over European society, and they went on to develop what has come to be known as the modern scientific method. As a result, over the next few hundred years, there was an incredible explosion of scientific discoveries led by the Copernican Revolution, Newtonian physics, Laplacian determinism, and Cartesian dualism. However, with the split from spirituality also came some very serious limitations in modern science. In places like ancient Greece and India, science and spirituality had always complemented one another, but as a result of the church's heavy-handedness throughout the Dark Ages, for better or for worse, modern science evolved completely independent of the metaphysical realm. These modern scientists asserted that all observable entities, including space and time, were independent realities, and that ideas not connected to the empirical world were deemed superfluous to any theories involving the physical sciences. According to them, if it couldn't be measured and verified independently, then it wasn't science. And even though Einstein's theory of relativity and the discovery of quantum mechanics have shattered this basic principle, modern science still marches on unabated. I think Aristotle said that deep within every man is the desire to know. It's one of the inborn desires that we have. We want to find out about the world. We want to find out why the seasons change. We want to find out how to make fire. We want to learn how this world around us works and how we can interact with it. And part of that is a very personal journey, but part of it is a collective journey. And that collective journey toward more and more knowledge is a lot, a lot of it is what we call scientific progress. Scientific progress is cavemen noticing the change of the seasons and first starting to put that together. 
and starting to notice how animals migrate and realizing they can use that fact to help get food. And it's modern particle accelerators, understanding the nature of high energy particles and everything in between is all of us trying to understand this universe we live in. Crucial to that process is having results that more than one person can verify. Um, if I do an experiment, I have to be able to describe it in such a way that someone else can turn around and do that same experiment and get the same result. Um, and once you have lots of different groups independently coming to the same conclusions, verifying the same predictions, that's when you start to build up a theory. When we're talking about science, as with anything else, we have to define our terms. You can define science very broadly as the search for knowledge. And then it includes mathematics and philosophy and religion and history. All those people are searching for different kinds of knowledge in different ways. I use the word science in a much more limited way, which some people would call the modern scientific method. Science involves doing experiments. You use the experiment to create a model. You use the model to create predictions, and whether the prediction comes true or not is the test of your model. That's one particular way of searching for one particular kind of truth. You cannot use the scientific method to figure out the past tense of a French verb, or George Washington's birthday, or what you should do with your life. There are other kind of truths to which it will direct you, but there are certain kinds of truths that are out of the domain of what I'm defining as science. I would say the most important thing that a scientist needs is an open mind. Science builds up theories, but all progress in science comes from the point where you say, here's new evidence that doesn't fit my theory, and therefore I have to adjust. And nobody is perfect at that. A lot of times, real progress in science comes not because the people who developed a theory accept that it was wrong, but because the evidence builds up against the theory and the next generation rejects the theory that the previous generation had come up with. The scientific project, the goal of what we call science, is prediction. Science exists in order to make more and more sophisticated predictions that if I do this, then this will happen. If these are the starting circumstances, those will be the ending circumstances. It's an incredibly broad project that ranges from figuring out the nature of subatomic particles to figuring out the birth of the universe to figuring out how to build new and better television sets. But there are other questions which don't fall into the domain of science. The word should appears nowhere in science. A scientist cannot tell you scientifically that you should be nice to other people, you should eat your vegetables, or even you should try to know good science, as opposed to, say, being superstitious. That statement, good science is good, superstition is bad, is not a scientific statement, because good and bad are not scientific adjectives. Science is about what is, what was, and what will be. It is not about what should be, or what we want to be, or what we should want to be. And in that sense, science does not address itself to the fundamental question of how to live your life. At some level, the most fundamental questions about the universe are ones that science cannot answer. I've heard this likened to the allegory of the cave from Plato, where the real world is happening out there and what we're seeing are the shadows. And somebody said that science is exploring those shadows. I would say the two most fundamental questions that anyone can ask are, what is the universe and what am I? And at the most basic level, I don't think science addresses either of those questions. At any given stage in science, there are certain starting points, axioms or postulates, things that we say 
for no reason. In Newton's world, that might be any two objects attract each other. And in our world, those postulates might include certain laws of how electricity and magnetism interact and how space warps around matter. But they're starting points. We just say, let's assume this is true. And if you ask, why is it true? Or even, what does it really mean? What is an electric field, really? What is an electron, really? There is no answer. An electron is an electron. An electric field is an electric field. And if someday we're able to break it down and analyze, oh, it's really made up of these things, then we'll ask, OK, what are those things, really? So no matter how far we get with science, there will be certain things that we say are true, but we can't explain why. Certain objects that we say are fundamental to the universe, and we therefore can't explain what they are. That's not a limitation of our current science. It's a limitation of science as a project. The way science works fundamentally starts with observations. You see a pattern of things in the world, and you think, OK, here are these 10 different things I saw happening. Can I come up with one rule that would seem to account for all of those? And then you have to turn that rule into a prediction. If I'm right, if here's the governing principle behind those 10 things, then here's what will happen in this 11th case. And you try it, and it works, and you gain some confidence in your theory, or it doesn't work, and you back off and retool, or it works the first 10 times, and then doesn't the 11th. And so you say, well, I was on to something, but I have to modify it. And it's that back and forth of observation, theory, prediction that defines the scientific method. If you were to ask a scientist, why is it that the apple falls from the tree? He would say, because of gravity. But that's not an explanation, it's just a word. So you push him a little harder. He says, any two objects attract each other, the apple is attracted to the Earth. And you say, OK, why do any two objects attract each other? And if he really knows his stuff, he will start to give you an answer in terms of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Mass warps space and then other mass travels in certain kind of paths through the warped space. And you say, OK, great. Why does mass warp space? And why does mass travel through certain? And ultimately, relatively soon, he's going to say, there is no answer to that why question you're asking. The best answer that you'll ever get from a scientist if you push hard enough is this. If we assume that the universe works that way for no reason at all, except we just assume it, then we get the correct predictions for the experiments that we run. Therefore, that seems like a pretty good assumption. This is a fundamental limitation of science. It can address questions about how things that we see are connected to each other. I see these many things happening, and I can reduce all of them to one clear, simple set of laws that then predicts all of those. But the questions about why does the universe exist at all, why does it have this particular set of laws, are simply outside the realm of what the scientific method can address. There's a very fundamental shift which happens in our way of looking at the universe around the time of Galileo, of Descartes, of Francis Bacon. But if I were to pick one person, it would be Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton has an apple fall in his head. He doesn't look up and say, oh, things fall down. That's not his great breakthrough. People already knew that. What Newton figures out is that the reason the apple fell down on his head, the explanation for the apple falling on his head, is the same explanation that he can use to describe why the planets are going around the sun as described by Copernicus. Newton has this breakthrough that we can craft rational laws based on what we see in the world around us, and we can apply those laws universally to the cosmos, to the planets, to the stars, to the entire universe. Very different from Aristotle's way of thinking that, well, there's one set of laws that apply down here and a different set of laws that apply up there. And suddenly, mankind's rational ability can encompass the stars, 
can, in a sense, control the universe. And the modern scientific way of looking at the world is born. I would say that crucial to what science is, is the fact that anything we believe is subject to verification and change. Once something has been verified a million times, that doesn't make it right. But it brings a huge weight of evidence that you have to overcome to overturn it. A great example of a scientific revolution would be the advent of modern science, the beginning of the 20th century. You had centuries of evidence for Newtonian physics, and then you started having experiments that contradicted it. You couldn't say all of that edifice was wrong, but you had to come up with a bigger structure that somehow included that as a special case. So, <clears throat> Newton is attempting to mathematically model and scientifically explain the solar system as described by Copernicus, and he creates these beautiful simple equations that don't quite work. And the planets wobble out of their orbits eventually, and he reasons, well, angels have to come down every now and then and put the planets back. Because his math wasn't quite there, his science wasn't quite there. Over the next hundred years, people fill in holes in the Newtonian science until they reach the point where they don't need the angels anymore. The science, the math, the law of gravity seems to describe the solar system perfectly. And for the first time, they start to think, we don't need God at all to describe the mechanics of the universe. God is no longer necessary. We can write down equations that describe it all. And in the 19th century, Maxwell uses equations, very simple experiments you can do on Earth to explain the nature of light and electricity and magnetism. And then in the 20th century, Einstein reframes our whole concept of space and time, still following a logical progression of we can do these little experiments here and figure out what the universe is like. Newton came up with a theory that works on every scale we can observe in our daily lives. Chairs falling, the moon orbiting about the Earth, the dynamics of the solar system, the dynamics of the galaxy, all of these things follow the laws that Newton set forth. But around the beginning of the 20th century, we were able to start measuring things at such extremes, moving so fast, on scales so small, on scales so big, that we started to see where those laws stopped working. So Laplace is the incarnation of the Newtonian universe, much more than Newton himself was. And Laplace writes down all the equations, and at one point he's asked, I don't see God anywhere in here. And he replies, I have no need for that hypothesis. That's a key turning point in intellectual history. We don't need God anymore. We've got it all figured out. And by extension, not only can we figure it out, we can control it. It's ours now. Because of our incredible brains, it's ours. In the case of special relativity, Einstein found that when things are going close to the speed of light, our normal notions of distance and time stop working. The distance between two objects, the time between two events, the way time itself passes, these are all relative. They'll be different for one observer and another and Einstein's theory says no one observer is more correct. There is no one right answer to how time is passing in this room. There's a right answer from each perspective. The birth of what we call modern physics, in many ways, is Einstein's special theory of relativity. It takes forward the Newtonian idea that we're going to rationally figure everything out, we're going to write equations that model everything, even space and time. What it abandons is the Newtonian idea that all of this stuff is going to make sense in our gut, that the universe is bound by our common sense, physical intuition of how things ought to work. 
No matter how much you study Einstein's relativity, no matter how much you work through the equations, at some level it doesn't make sense. It works, it makes good predictions. Intellectually it holds together, but it doesn't have that same ball bouncing off a ball, physical intuitive feeling that Newtonian mechanics gives you. And in that sense, the universe is suddenly a little beyond the reach of what you can get your head around. Which is, of course, then made far worse by Einstein's general theory of relativity and then totally wiped out by quantum mechanics. When you start measuring things that are really small on the scale of an atom or smaller, you find that the rules that govern them change much more than they did for relativity when things are going fast. And the whole notion that an object exists at a particular place, at a particular time, doesn't work anymore. An electron can kind of exist here and kind of exist there and be in a mixed state of the two. And that doesn't match anything in our daily experience. Quantum mechanics was so unintuitive, so hard to grasp, that even Einstein himself could not accept the ramifications of it. In quantum mechanics, there is real randomness. This is one of the things Einstein could not accept. Given identical starting conditions, you can end up in different results. So the universe is random. In quantum mechanics, there's what they call non-locality. Something that happens at A can have an instantaneous effect on what's happening at B. In quantum mechanics, it's impossible to do what Laplace thought we could do. Laplace believed if we knew the exact position and velocity of every particle in the universe at once, we could predict the entire future of the universe. Quantum mechanics says you can't know that. It isn't knowable because the particles themselves don't know. The information isn't out there. The universe becomes a much more nebulous place. Einstein was one of the key people who developed quantum mechanics, but he never believed the theory, the way it was formulated. And one of the things that bothered him the most about it was that it implied what's called non-locality, that something happening at one place can instantly affect something far away. You can have two particles that are so-called entangled. Their states are connected to each other at an arbitrary distance apart. And we now know that that is an unavoidable feature of quantum mechanics. There's no way you can tweak the theory to take that feature out. In the way that we normally look at the world, a, a billiard ball hits another billiard ball and they bounce. That's real solid stuff. Whereas in electromagnetic theory, we talk about these weird things, invisible things called electric fields, and that's a little more nebulous. In modern physics, it's totally the reverse of that. Why does the billiard ball bounce off the other billiard ball when in fact they are both mostly empty space and could have passed through each other? And the answer is because of these weird electric fields. The electric fields are the real thing that cause the billiard balls to bounce. And the idea that, well, the billiard balls are so solid that they had to bounce, that's the illusion. The things that seem solid to us are not solid. And the things that seem very nebulous to us are very real. Again, our intuition about the world doesn't hold up with what the way the world actually is. Do not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. There is no spoon? Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends. It is only yourself.
Einstein never reconciled himself with quantum mechanics. He went to his grave not believing that the theory was complete. He believed the experimental results, but he believed our understanding of them was fundamentally flawed, and he had this famous series of debates with Bohr. And the consensus among modern scientists is generally that Bohr won those debates, that Einstein failed to show a fundamental flaw in the theory. And yet, I think there are still a lot of people who agree with Einstein's basic conclusion that the theory can't be complete as it stands now. We don't really understand what's happening at the heart of quantum mechanics. Studying and learning about modern physics, about relativity, about quantum mechanics, is a constant exercise in humility. It's a constant realization that the things that you thought were solid and real and physical are not that at all. They are illusions created by various, very difficult to understand, very difficult to get your head around, uh, ma mathematical effects and physical weirdness, those are the things that are real. Waveforms are real. Electric fields are real. Really solid objects that we manipulate every day are not unreal, but they aren't at all what we think they are. A brick may be a real thing, but it's not what we think of as a brick, a big solid mass of stuff that nothing can get through. It's not at all that. It's much more an artifact of these difficult to understand mathematical quantities. So Bohr famously said that anyone who isn't shocked by quantum mechanics doesn't understand it. And I absolutely agree with that. And I think almost any modern physicist would agree with that. We evolved to, uh, to see things in a certain way. We are used to balls being in a particular place and then falling. Um, things don't work like that in the quantum world. This idea that an object can be kind of in a mix of being here and being here and being somewhere in between. But then when you look at it, you only find it in one of those three places. Just has no analog in our experience that we can draw on. So it's a completely new way of looking at the world. I'll make two different statements. Statement number one, every human being has an innate desire to know. That's Aristotle. Statement number two, the force of electromagnetism involves the electric and magnetic fields which cause each other according to certain equations. That's according to Maxwell. A modern scientist or philosopher would say that second statement is real science. We can model it, we can mathematically describe it, we can do experiments on it and measure things. The first statement, maybe it's true and maybe it isn't and maybe it emerges from the brain, but it's a little bit squishy and so we're not going to consider it as real. Ultimately, it's those electric and magnetic fields that are real, and our desire to know is a little more suspect as far as real truth. Whereas I would argue it's the exact opposite. Everything we understand about electric and magnetic fields comes from our desire to know. If you want to really go back to the basics, our desire to know is more fundamental you start there and you start to say, where does our desire to know come from? And so instead of looking out there for what's fundamental, ultimately you always have to come back and look in here for what's driving the whole process. That's the starting point. Every physicist knows that there are unresolved issues in the interpretation of quantum mechanics, understanding what the world is really about, and what has happened over the last 50 years or so is not that those issues have gotten settled. It's been a sort of silent collective agreement among physicists to not think about them much. And it's gotten to the point where anything having to do with, what, with the question, what is the fundamental reality that these equations are describing, is viewed with suspicion. 
There's a wonderful quotation from Bell, and I don't remember it exactly, but what he said is that most modern physicists make the assumption that I could understand what quantum mechanics is really saying if I ever found 20 minutes or so to think about it and leave it there. A question that I have asked students before is, if you could know the answer to one question and only one question, suddenly you're going to have certain answer to one question, what would that question be? And a room full of students will give me many different answers and I'll fill up a whiteboard with questions like, you know, what is the meaning of life? And what should I be doing about this and such? And, and who should I marry? And what job should I get? And just tons and tons of different questions that they really need to know the answers to. Almost none of the questions they answer fall within the domain of science. And I don't mean we haven't answered them scientifically yet. I mean, we can't possibly answer those questions scientifically. Science might someday tell you, if you marry this person, you will be happy. But science can't tell you happiness is good. Science might tell you, if you get this job, you will make money. But it still leaves open the questions, what do you actually need to accomplish with your life? And science can't help with that. There's no doubt that the modern scientific revolution has ushered humanity into a new era of industrial advancements and technological achievements. However, because of its inherent limitations, the modern scientific method seems to have also opened up a Pandora's box of both positives and negatives that seems to have balanced each other out. Life expectancies are longer. We have more conveniences than ever. Things like global travel are taken for granted. And yet when we look back on all that modern science has brought us, one question we should be asking ourselves is this. Has science made society happier? Study after study that surveys individual happiness in all the nations around the globe finds that it is always the people in the world's poorest countries that are the most fulfilled, while the people living in the world's richest and most advanced countries are the least happy. The true spirit of the scientific endeavor has always been a search for truth. Is it not reasonable to think that a search for truth should also lead to happiness and well-being? If you used happiness and fulfillment as the basis for determining whether or not the modern scientific method has been a success, what would your verdict be? And the most relevant question of all is, are you happy? What if there was another branch of science? One that, rather than being self-limited, was a comprehensive system of knowledge that also led to a greater sense of well-being throughout the society. In the true essence of the word science, there's an ancient technology from India called Vedanta that includes a proven system for acquiring knowledge at such a deep level that it even transforms the lives of the scientists who use it. While many people in Western societies may think of Eastern traditions mostly in terms of just meditation, the Vedantic approach is an extremely comprehensive one that includes a regimen of physical postures and practices, dietary guidelines, pranayamas, and other techniques all developed to fine-tune our nervous systems in order to prepare the human laboratory for conducting this scientific experiment. So what exactly is Vedanta? Not only does Vedanta represent the highest knowledge, it also provides a means of attaining it as well. This is part of its universal appeal. It's practical. Let's say you wanted to learn how to swim. You can go out and read all the books on swimming that you can get your hands on. You can watch videos of Michael Phelps winning races, learn the names of all the various strokes, read other people's blogs about their scuba diving adventures. But at the end of the day, if you want to learn how to swim, you're going to have to get into the water. And the same holds true in the search for self. You can go out and read all the books that you want, watch people like Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra on TV, talk to other people about their experiences, but sooner or later, if you're serious about your search, you're going to have to get into the water. And Vedanta provides a user manual to help guide you through this process. The modern scientific method provides a step-by-step -step procedure that includes assumptions and definitions, axioms and hypotheses, protocols, methods and techniques that creates a framework for scientists to conduct experiments to either prove or disprove a theory. Once meaningful results have been produced, the scientist then goes out into the community and invites others to replicate the experiment to verify the results. 
This is exactly the same thing that Vedanta does. It invites you to use a step-by-step -step process that includes assumptions and definitions, axioms and hypotheses, protocols, methods, and techniques to replicate experiments that others have done and verify their results. The one thing that sets Vedanta apart from what we consider to be conventional science is that in the science of Vedanta, if you want proof, you have to conduct the experiments yourself. You can't rely on others to do it for you. There's many different paths to enlightenment. It's possible you can go live on a deserted island for 20 years and become enlightened. And there are stories of soldiers who've taken bullets to the head, or a neurologist who had a stroke who had enlightenment experiences. But if you're a sincere seeker looking for the ultimate truth, why not utilize the time-tested and proven techniques that have been passed down throughout the ages to help you find what you're looking for? The word Veda means to know. And whoever seen life as it is, who are inquired themselves within oneself, they have come to know so wonderful realities or truths of this whole phenomena of the life. Then those insights were called Vedas. Now Vedas, they are uh, the transcendental knowledge, means the knowledge that does not come by the sense organs. Knowledge is of two types. The knowledge that comes through the sense organs become physical science. And the knowledge that comes by transcending the sense organs is what is called Veda. And then a Vedanta is the culmination of this, where the ultimate of knowledge is obtained. Anta means culmination or the end. So uh, the Upanishads, which are almost at the end part of this literature called Vedas, which is maybe how many thousands years old, we don't know. Maybe 10,000 years old or even older. The word the Vedanta, it means the end of all knowing. What is end of all knowing? The highest knowledge, which is the non-dual, means there is no two, and which is the source of all life. That is what, knowing that reality, they call it Vedanta, end of all knowing. Vedanta has two aspects, the theory and practice. In theory, you understand the truth being uh, the, uh, the transcendental, all-pervading reality, which is actually yourself. Now, to realize it, to make it into your practical, tangible experience that is called yoga. And the yoga is uh, divided or categorized into four main parts. Uh, jnana yoga, where your intellect is trained uh, to perceive the truth uh, in the intellectual way and thus you understand it in bhakti, your emotions are trained. Devotion, uh, that is given more emphasis. In karma yoga, your actions are trained accordingly. Uh, but in raja yoga, uh, it is approached the scientific uh, way. So, raja yoga therefore is the uh, scientific path of realizing, experiencing, this transcendental truth. To get at the truth, you should not exclude anything. And see, if we exclude what is beyond the limit of the senses, we are only going to get at the partial truth. And what Vedanta does is, it doesn't reject what is visible but it also accepts that there could be something which is not immediately visible to the senses and the mind. And because it tries to inquire and investigate into that reality, it appears to me to be more comprehensive than some of the modern approaches to science. Raja Yoga is a scientific method of reaching the truth. Now, when I say science, uh, remember that every science has its methods. Chemistry has its methods of arriving at the truths of chemistry. 
astronomy has its own methods of arriving at the truths of astronomy. There you will have to, of course, use telescopes and so forth. And so, Raja Yoga, a science, has its own methods of understanding the functions of mind, correlating them and so forth. So, it is a science in its own right of arriving at the truth that is beyond reason. Modern science limits its inquiry or experimentation to things which can be seen and measured. And that which cannot be measured is either deemed irrelevant or something not worth inquiring into. And so matters such as rebirth or anything which are beyond the senses or beyond measurability uh, are not the objects of science. And to, that, to the people extent who don't accept it, science does lim limit it in that sense. The Vedanta says that you are not the body, you are not the mind, huh? you are not the ego, you are not the memory, you are more than that. And what more than that? It's called Sat Chit Ananda. The Satya means it is non-changing, it is there all the time. The Chitta means it is conscious, it is aware. Sat Chit Ananda and it is bliss. And when it says I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am not the ego, but it says I am all this, yet I am not only this much, I am more than that. And these three things, just a shadow of me, are just a reflection of me. And that is what Vedanta says about it. The definition of truth in Vedanta that makes complete sense to me is that that which is real is also eternal. Now it is an axiom in Vedanta. Vedanta it's never really proves it. but. But that's something that has been a part of our human way of thinking all along. The reason we dismiss dreams as unreal is because they don't last. Relatively speaking, this waking world seems to be real because it's more lasting than the dream. And what Vedanta says is, just as the waking world is more real than the dreams, is there anything more real than the waking world? And if we accept these gradations in reality, then a scientific way of asking would be, we cannot reject that there will be something more real than the waking, since waking itself is seen as more real than dreaming. You can notice this, that all different religions in the world, they speak of the ultimate one reality, which is the source of all this apparent multiplicity. And thus, actually, all our little, little minds are part of the whole universal mind. It is uh, uh, our addiction to this littleness, this pettiness, that is preventing us from having access to the universal consciousness, universal mind. And so, what all religions in essence tell you to give up this pettiness, become big, become one, become universal. And Vedanta tells it in a scientific, rational manner that a modern person, uh, without uh, having allegiance to any particular person or a religion, can appreciate it. Well, among the hypotheses that a Vedanta student begins with is that the world that I see outside of me may not be as real as I imagine it to be. My own body, my own mind, my own ego may not be the essential parts of my personality, that there is something beyond the body, mind, ego, which is the spirit, pure consciousness, that is who I really am. Now, these are all the truths, truth claims put forward by Vedanta which one accepts as a working hypothesis and then begins to inquire into it intellectually and then carry out the practices and then experience it for oneself. See, the procedure that we use in Raja Yoga is not an unfamiliar one to the scientist. It is very similar to what the scientists do. Even the scientists, they begin with certain assumptions, uh, they have certain axioms, a certain 
basis for uh, verifications they have their methodology and very accurately precisely they work it out raj yoga does exactly the same thing but not with the outer world alone but inner world as well so this is a special feature about raj yoga like every science has its own feature raj yoga has its own special feature it has its assumptions uh, it has its methodology it has its techniques and then uh, the results will be there for us to see and to verify the the protocols for this experiment are the needed preparations for the experiment to succeed and since in this experiment the instrument is the mind and the object being studied is also the mind so first thing is to clean the instrument make the instrument fit for the experiment and that would include then things such as purifying the mind but purifying i mean having control over the mind having control over the senses the practice of forbearance the practice of contentment cheerfulness is also an important part of the practice and a willingness to accept now let us see here that why raj yoga uh, emphasizes the breath this is in fact a wonderful discovery that how to handle our emotions we really do not see where they are and how to control them but uh, raj yoga found a technique you see that every emotion is mapped into our breath it is reflected in our breath our breath changes according to the emotion if i am angry it gets reflected in breath uh, if i have greed that gets reflected in breath uh, if i have fear that gets reflected in breath so mm, what does it suggest that if i can control the breath then i can control the emotions as well because they have a kind of one to one mapping and thus we can control emotions by controlling breath in fact what other tools do we have to control emotions in in vedanta the whole of visible universe visible and invisible universe is reduced to two basic ingredients matter and force and so that basic force which manifests itself in many different ways that is prana it could be a physical force it could be magnetic force it could be the force of thought feeling emotions anything which is a manifestation of energy gross or subtle that is prana you look at the prana the prana is a is the life energy which is making these trees become grow that high and the itta prana is making that leaves become greenery and the prana is making us to think even to understand things and to know even the scientists are able to discover the electricity and behind that discovering if you look at what made them to discover that force is called prana even the being a creative that creativity which is forcing within us to be a creative that is what prana is the control of prana is important because every activity every motion in the universe is needs force or needs energy and in order to be able to do this in our experiment we need control over that energy because only when we have control over it we will be able to manipulate it in the direction we want it and so therefore the control of prana becomes very important it's important in the cure of diseases as they do in ayurveda when any kind of an illness is seen as a prana not flowing regularly within the body and so if you have control over prana your illnesses can be cured the same thing is true with the mind as well when the mind is not functioning well or the mind is not able to focus if you have control over prana then you can regulate the flow of prana there and then make the mind focused and only when the mind is focused mind is able to concentrate you get knowledge so control of prana becomes very very important prana is the universal force that penetrates everything 
human bodies, the animals, the plants, and even the inanimate bodies like rocks. Mm -hmm. For my ally is the Force, and a powerful ally it is. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you. Here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land and the ship. The search for spiritual truth is, in some ways, very much like the search for scientific truth in the narrow way that I define science, and in some ways different. It's like it in the sense that you perform experiments, hopefully with a very open mind towards what the results of those experiments will be. So you say, all right, such and such said I should meditate this way. I'll try it, and I'll see if I get results. And if the experiments don't work out, after you've tried them rigorously and long enough, then you have to try something else. Spiritual work is like science in the sense that you read what the great scientists before you have said and you test it yourself. You don't start from nothing. You, as Newton said, ride on the shoulders of giants. Spiritual work is unlike science in the sense that the ultimate test of everything is completely personal. It's not objective. It's not out there. I can't show you the results of my experiments. You have to do those experiments for yourself. And spiritual work is unlike science in the all-important sense that the questions it's trying to answer are different. It's not solely concerned with predicting the universe out there, the shadows on the walls of Plato's cave. Spiritual work is concerned with asking the question, how do I relate to this universe around me? How do I find my place in it? What is it that the universe is beckoning me to do? Those aren't scientific questions. If you want the answers to those questions, which I maintain we all do, you have to look elsewhere. It's possible to categorize everything that exists into two prime categories. One is consciousness and pure consciousness and anything other than consciousness as material. So both our body and mind, both are material. Although the word spiritual kind of is bandied about so easily nowadays, anything that is uplifting people consider spiritual, but still just a state of the mind. Now the body can be seen, the mind cannot be seen. That's the only difference between the two. In every other respect, they are identical. It's like if you put junk in the body, the body falls ill, put junk in the mind, the mind falls ill. Both have their doctors, both get exhausted, and so on. And because they both are material, they act and react upon each other. And that's why, even according to modern medicine, most of the illnesses are psychophysical in nature. Apart from this body and mind, and one more point, because the thoughts are also material, that's why the be, mind becomes a receptacle to them. So anything other than pure consciousness is material. And what Vedanta says is, our true nature is that we are consciousness and everything else is only an object of perception which doesn't have an independent existence apart from my own. In the early days of quantum mechanics, it seemed to the foremost scientists of that time that there were holes in the theory that needed to be filled in with the idea of consciousness, that the nature of the universe had to include this piece called consciousness because the systems seemed to behave very different when they were observed than when they were not observed. Which of course begs the question, what does that mean observed? And they came to the conclusion, observed means interacts with this conscious entity. So consciousness seemed to be, for them, a key part of the physical phenomena. That's a belief that very few modern physicists would subscribe to. Consciousness has been in many ways written out of the script of quantum mechanics. 
There are still problems and questions about quantum mechanics, but very few current scientists believe that the answer to those questions is to invoke this notion of consciousness or anything human-centric like that. The dominant view among scientists, mainstream scientists today is that everything that we can observe in the universe is just a product of material processes. And so people tend to assume that consciousness is just a series of chemical events in our brain. And there are many people, myself included, who find that view inconsistent. You can explain how this process in my brain leads to this behavior, but that doesn't explain how I have this subjective experience. So a lot of people, although it is not the mainstream, believe that this is a gap in science, the explanation of consciousness. There's a professor at Stanford named Andre Linde who is one of the most prominent cosmologists in the world today, who has said that he thinks in the coming century, one of the components of science that may really come to the fore is this issue of trying to incorporate consciousness into our understanding of the world. Because the way that we think of the world today really has no room for consciousness. I think it's possible to look upon the whole of existence as a series of oceans. There's an ocean of matter. So at the material level, my body is made of matter, this grass, the sky, the trees, the, the bodies of these animals. And the atoms and molecules here are continually kind of mixing with this world outside. When I eat food, what is an apple, when I eat it, it just becomes a part of my body afterwards. So, at the material level, it's all one, even materially. Then there is the ocean of ideas. The ideas in your mind, the ideas in his mind, the ideas in the different people's minds, they're all like an ocean of ideas and thoughts. And then there is the ocean of consciousness. So there are all these parallel oceans. And so we are really one, not only in a highest spiritual sense, but even at the material level, my body being a part of this material world is still a part of this ocean of matter. So if you talk to most modern scientists or philosophers and you bring up the word consciousness, they will either say it doesn't exist at all, it's an illusion, uh, which obviously begs the question, who's being illusioned? Or it's a, a property of the brain chemistry and physics. It emerges from the neurons and the chemicals and so on in the brain. That the only reality is the physics of the brain, and one of the things that seems to be built on that is this notion of consciousness. To me, that's completely backwards. We believe in the physics of the brain for the same reason that we believe in the blue of the sky. Because we see things, because we feel things, because we hear things, we start with events in consciousness, and we infer a physical reality from them, not the other way around. Either the world of consciousness and the world of physics both coexist, or the only real world is the world of consciousness, and physics is a manifest property of that, not the other way around. There's a huge mystery at the heart of our understanding of quantum mechanics. We say that an electron is in many places at once, and yet every time I look at it, I only find it in one place. And this is called the collapse of the wave function. And the question is, what is actually causing that? Many of the early pioneers of quantum mechanics, Schrodinger, Pauli, Heisenberg, Wigner, believed that the element that causes a particle to change when you observe it could be the consciousness of the observer. And Wigner, in particular, was the strongest proponent of this, but many of the most prominent figures in quantum mechanics believed that this was either true or at least a strong possibility. More recently, 
that idea has fallen very much out of favor. You would be hard pressed to find a modern physicist at all prominent in the community who believes that observation in quantum mechanics occurs because of consciousness. If you step back and you look at the modern scientific project, modern now meaning Newton and forward, we're trying to understand the universe based on experiments. The experiments mean we observe things, we see things, we hear things, and we take our observations at the starting point. The ultimate litmus test of any scientific theory is our observations, which in turn happen in our consciousness. I see a meter point this way, I see a light flash. Those events take place within my consciousness and based on my conscious experience of them, I infer that there's an external reality which is causing them to happen and I start to describe that external reality mathematically. So to me, it seems that no matter how hard they try to write consciousness out of the script, consciousness is the starting place for the entire scientific endeavor. When you're talking about science, it's crucial to realize that it is a human endeavor. And it's not an abstract process, it's something that people do. And the science that people do is always influenced by who they are, what their biases are, what their preconceptions are, what their interests are. So nobody comes at a scientific experiment without a certain bias. Many times, scientists get locked into a view of the world that becomes a kind of dogma. And it's very hard for them to break out of that. It's often impossible for them to break out of that. The word dogma is a word that we use for beliefs that have become too rigidly held. They're beliefs that you can't let go of, and in that sense, they become an obstacle. In the spiritual search or in the scientific search, you have to start with certain beliefs. And you have to say, those are the best beliefs I can work with right now, because if you have no beliefs, you can't make progress. But if you become attached to those beliefs, if you say, I refuse to let go of these beliefs no matter what happens, then they have become a dogma in the negative sense. They impede your progress. That's why when Einstein came along with his theory of relativity, the scientists of the time couldn't accept it. It fit logic, it fit science, but it didn't fit their dogmas. And the same thing happens to us on a personal level as we seek spiritual or personal truth. The obstacle is the things that don't quite fit, but we can't let go of them. An example of dogma in science is the Copernican Revolution. From the time of the ancient Greeks all the way through Copernicus, people were looking at the stars, trying to find models of them that could work and predict the motions they saw, and it never worked because their starting point was it all has to be circles. Circles are perfect, therefore movements in the sky must be circles. It was when Kepler was willing to say, let me see what kind of motion I'm actually seeing out there, hey, it's not circles, that we finally got a model that matched what we saw in the solar system. If you wanted to be the world's greatest violinist, ultimately, you would be answerable to the music inside you. The music inside you would have to guide you to places no one has ever been to make music in a way that no one has ever made it. But you wouldn't start by saying, I'm gonna make up how to hold the bow. I'm gonna see if I can make up what the best scale is. Because a lot of other people who are also very musical have over the decades and centuries figured out, hold the bow like this, here's a good musical scale. And in the end, maybe you're John Cage and you decide, no, I am gonna make up a new scale, but you don't get there before you look at what they've done, think about what they've done, internalize what they've done. You're not gonna to go to new places unless you build on all the work that came before you. The same is true in science, and the same is true in spiritual work. 
Thousands of years of progress have been made by people just like you who want the same answers and who worked on it for decades and then passed on to other people who worked on it for decades. You owe it to yourself to look at the work they've done and experiment in the ways that they've suggested experimenting and then ultimately decide what's working for you and what isn't working for you rather than trying to start from zero. A lot of these theories bring up the question, if I can represent the universe in this way or this way, and they're equivalent in terms of their predictions. We have these different interpretations of quantum mechanics. We have these different ways we can imagine that the universe is storing its information, and there's no way we can tell which one is true because they predict the same results from experiments. It really raises the issue that we can't use these kinds of experiments to tell which of these is actual reality? If you go back to Aristotle, philosophy is this, or, or Socrates, Plato, it's this very general search for truth, this, back to the root of the word science. It includes spiritual, personal, drama, it, and it also includes what we would call science. They were all together, the search for truth. Gradually, it's gotten carved up, and so to a modern scientist and to most modern philosophers as well. There's this very narrow idea that scientists search for truth by doing experiments and so on. And then there are these other people who do other things that aren't so important or aren't as real. And certainly when we talk about spiritual work or even uh, talk about understanding ourselves on a personal level, that's not science and that's not, that's just sort of the soft stuff. The soft stuff isn't the stuff of good, hard science. That distinction's relatively recent. I'm not an expert on the history of science, but my understanding is that a lot of the split between science and religion goes back to the Inquisition, where the Catholic Church really set itself up in opposition to science, and scientists reacted by defining themselves very much in opposition to the theocracy. And that's led to a lot of bias. There have been many cases where people on both sides of this divide have dug in their heels and said, we don't want to believe this because that's what the other side is saying. According to the worldview that Vedanta presents, that everything is really one, not two. Now somehow, that oneness seems to have been shattered. And then we have this enormous diversity outside of us and a lot of diversity within us. Now the diversity within us, everything, the wholeness of our own personality has kind of gotten broken up. So even our own mind, which should have been one whole, has gotten divided. So there is the conscious part of the mind, there is the unconscious part of the mind. There is the part of the mind which aspires towards truth, there is a part of the mind which is dragged down by what is only ephemeral or what is not permanent. So this inner tension in the mind is what is creating the stress and anxiety that people experience in their daily life. So the mind that is observing the mind is really one part of the mind which for lack of a better term I can call the higher mind or a mind which has become more open to the light trying to help and rescue the lower mind which is still wallowing in attachment and therefore got caught up in these stresses and anxieties of daily life. So that's how it's the one part of my own mind observing the other part of my own mind. A lot of people when they think of science, what they're thinking of isn't science, it's current scientific theory. The periodic table of the elements as we currently understand it, the current list of forces and subatomic particles, our current belief in how the bloodstream works. These are all current scientific theories that could be overturned next week. They are the best theories we have at the moment. But that's not what science is. Science is a process. Science is an open-minded inquiry which says, I will go with the best theory that fits the evidence right now, and then if new evidence comes along, I'll change that. The spiritual search is the same way. Fundamentally, there's a process that you follow. 
And the process involves open-minded inquiry. It involves being open to the idea that your current set of theories or beliefs might be wrong. You're not attached to your current set of beliefs. You're attached to a ruthless, open-minded inquiry to find the answers. The significance of asking the question, who am I, is to arrive at the understanding of what my true identity is. Because we see that physically we have changed. When we were born, we were only weighed a few pounds. And now physically we look different. Our thoughts and ideas have changed. So physically I have changed. My ideas, emotions, feelings have changed. And yet I feel I'm the same person. So what is it that has remained unchanged in me? And so that unchanging part of my personality is who I really am. So when I ask the question who I really am, I am expected to reject everything that has changed in me so that I can arrive at that unchanging part. And therefore, this is a very important ingredient of this experiment about asking who I am. Ultimately, the only guide to your spiritual progress has to be a guide inside you that says these things are working and those things aren't. But you don't start with nothing. You start with thousands of years of other people who have been trying to answer the same questions and who have come up with answers. You don't have to believe their answers, but you owe it to yourself to look into what they've said and to try it. If a whole lot of the people that you respect the most say, you should try sitting with your legs crossed in this way, it would be, to my mind, very irrational for you to say, I'm not going to try that. It doesn't make sense to me. It's rational to say, let me try it and see if it works, because they have they tried it for decades. If they all say, let me, maybe you should be vegetarian, try being vegetarian. It's not that all these things are guaranteed to work, and it's not that if you don't do these things, you're guaranteed to fail, but it's only rational to try what many, many people have said probably works, rather than reinvent the whole wheel from scratch. Vedanta is a science, and therefore it is universal. It has to be universal to be a science, and it is based on principles. It is, in that sense, not a religion that is based on a person as such. And this is a big difference, like uh, this religion like Judaism, or Christianity, or Islam, or Buddhism, uh, where the inspiration is derived from a person. Whereas Vedanta uh, tells you to depend not on person, but on principle. When I'm teaching people about Einstein's theory of relativity or about quantum mechanics, if the person simply absorbs it like more classical physics, okay, these are the equations, okay, this is the predictions and so on, okay, I get it, then I know the person has not really understood it. The people who actually understand what I'm saying are the people who look up sometimes very heatedly at some point and say, that can't possibly be right. The universe can't work that way. You must have gotten something wrong there. If they don't get to that point, they don't really understand what these theories are saying because these theories are so radical. These theories so violate our common sense about the way the universe works that you can't possibly engage them without having that reaction. And I believe very strongly that spiritual work works the same way. Ultimately, it is counterintuitive. Ultimately, it goes against your common sense expectations, your conventions that you've been brought up with. And at some point, you have to look it in the eye and say, this can't be right, or you're not doing it. Vedanta, being science, has to be universal. Vedanta, therefore, is not a particularized religion that, uh, like Christianity, or Judaism, or Islam, uh, or Hinduism, taken in a limited sense, Vedanta is a philosophy, a psychology uh, that supports really all religions. And therefore, 
when one practices Vedanta, one becomes uh, a follower, a better follower of his or her own faith. Like a Christian will become a better Christian. Uh, a Muslim, if follows Vedanta, will become a better Muslim. Uh, a Jewish person will become a better Jewish person if uh, follows the principles of Vedanta. So Vedanta is really a, a method. It gives you a scientific understanding. It is not something that uh, makes you confined to a given system. It does not tell you to believe anything. It does not demand your allegiance uh, to certain beliefs. And therefore, it is universal in its approach, in its nature, like any science, basically. I think reason is a great gift that we have. And we should apply it as much as possible. Recognizing also that reason has its limits. We can go as far as reason will take us. And then there is this great leap through our own inner deep inquiry, deep practice of meditation, deep contemplation. We are able to see truths which reason alone cannot take us to. But having then experience those truths, we find that those truths don't contradict reason. So they are beyond reason, but don't contradict reason. And I think that is where the highest truth lies according to Vedanta. Because reason is a limited tool, limited equipment. And with the limited equipment, you can only reach to a limited truth. But what we are wanting is an eternal truth. And therefore, that eternal truth is beyond reason. Human life, if we see, is a bundle of contradictions and incongruence. To make any sense of it, one has to really transcend reason. And you can take the help of reason to transcend reason. In fact, that is what one Vedantin says, that use reason to transcend reason. We need to go beyond reason. But reason shows the way to, to go beyond reason. There we will be able to really uh, get the experience and they uh, can make proper sense of all our understanding and experience, not just through reason. The, the limitations of the mind are these, that we operate in a domain that is controlled by time, space, and causality. We cannot think beyond time. We cannot think about anything which doesn't occupy some space. And we cannot think of anything which doesn't deal in terms of cause and effect. And that's the limitation of reasoning also, because anything which is beyond these three factors, uh, the mind is just, can't do anything about it. And the truth according to Vedanta lies beyond time, beyond space, and beyond the law of causality. We normally see the two levels of the functioning of our personality, our mind, one is where uh, there is no reason involved. The actions happen instinctively. And instinctive reasoning uh, is a different thing. Means there is no reasoning involved. You see it in animals that uh, the action uh, just follows an external impetus. That is instinct. Then there is the level of reasoning that where you cogitate, you join the facts together and then you come to a conclusion on the basis of rationality. This is, uh, you can see that instinct is a lower level, reasoning is a higher level, but there is still a level that transcends this reason where the mind 
become super conscious and raj yoga tells us that we can each uh, reach that state uh, we all have the potential to reach that state of super consciousness the state that is beyond reason mm. they say we only use a fraction of our brain's true potential now that's when we're awake when we're asleep our mind can do almost anything such as so well, imagine you're designing a building, right? You consciously create each aspect. But sometimes it feels like it's almost creating itself, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah like I'm discovering it. Genuine inspiration, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in a dream, our mind continuously does this. We create and perceive our world simultaneously. And our mind does this so well that we don't even know what's happening. That allows us to get right in the middle of that process. How? By taking over the creating part. Now, this is where I need you. You create the world of the dream. We bring the subject into that dream, and they fill it with their subconscious. How could I ever acquire enough detail to make them think that it's reality? Well, dreams, they feel real while we're in them, right? It's only when we wake up that we realize something was actually strange. Let me ask you a question. You, you never really remember the beginning of a dream, do you? You always wind up right in the middle of what's going on. I guess, yeah. So how did we end up here? Well, we just came from the, uh... Think about it, Ariadne. How did you get here? Where are you right now? We're dreaming? Speaking of, I'm not here, this is not happening, it's more kind of an intellectual exercise. I mean, if, I'm, if I feel I'm here, and if I see all this happening, for me to say it's not happening, it's more an intellectual denial. What's more accurate, I think, is that I see these things happening, but are they real? So seeing things happening itself is not problematic, as to see them as happening really. But if I see things happening and know that it's not real, it's just like a movie being played out, that's not contradictory to what Vedanta says. So Vedanta doesn't refer to absence of perception, but seeing what is outside as real. When the Vedanta says that you know you are not the body, you are not the mind, you are not the ego, and this whole cosmos or whatever appearing in this around us is just nothing but an illusion. But as long as you are not realized, this whole whatever is around this body, mind, it is so real that Vedanta says because you are not at woke up or awakened by this dream. It is called Samasti and the Vesti means a collective dream and an individual dream. It's working together. Unless, like in the night we see a dream and all appears to be real unless we are not awake. And the same way it says, unless you won't realize your true nature, which is conscious, bliss and eternal, unless you are not awakened to that higher supreme reality, it is just a dream and it is appears very real dream. I don't think no one can say I'm not here because who is the one who is saying it? Is the one saying it here or not? What I can say is what I see as here, that is this body, that's not me. But I don't think I can say I am not here. In an absolute sense, I am not here and this is not happening. As long as there is the consciousness of there, there will be the consciousness of here. The two are linked. So if I'm not here, I'm not there either. I'm not anywhere. Well, although this is all illusion, Raj Yoga tells you the path to go beyond this illusion and get the reality that is beyond words. Well, as long by here, I mean that I'm not there. My knowledge of here or the perception of here depends on my perception of there. So if I'm not here, I'm not there either. In which case, I'm not anywhere. Which is why Vedanta would finally end up by just saying, I am. Science starts with observation. But actually, before the observation, you need a theory, a paradigm, as Kuhn calls it, to guide you in figuring out what observations are particularly interesting or worth making. What experiments should you perform? 
if you believe that the universe is structured in this way, then you perform these experiments and the results are very important. Those other experiments you don't bother with and the results are not so important. So your theory guides you in making observations. So here's a question. Supposing you took as a starting point the theory that consciousness is everything, that everything out there is simply what arises inside consciousness and consciousness is the substrate of all reality. The I am is fundamental and the outer world, the walls and the chairs and so on are merely artifacts. What experiments would that guide you to do? What scientific approach or experimental approach would you take in order to investigate reality if that were your starting point? A very wise man once asked the question, would you rather be happy or right? And if you've understood the implications made in this film, it's possible that a great many things that we've held onto our entire lives as being true, either on the physical level, intellectually, or even on the emotional level, may not be so true after all. It's okay to be wrong. And in fact, if there's a single point to be made in this film, that's it. And unless any of us were born enlightened, for us to become self-realized means that an unavoidable part of that process is to accept that we were wrong about a great many things. Our intellects are bound by our perceptions, and what we perceive is limited by our five senses. From what we've learned through Einstein's relativity and quantum mechanics, what we get through our five senses is actually more unreal than it is real. As they say in the computer industry, garbage in, garbage out. In other words, a computer is only as good as the data that it's fed. We know that there's a limit to reason. There's a small sphere in which human reasoning can operate. Any attempt to go beyond that sphere is impossible, and yet it is beyond this field of reason that therein lies all that humanity holds most dear. The answers to the questions of whether or not there's a supreme intelligence guiding this universe, whether or not there's a God, whether or not there's an immortal soul are all beyond this field of reasoning. Einstein went to his grave unwilling to accept that he was wrong. Are you willing to make that same mistake? Or are you going to be smarter than Einstein and consider the possibility that maybe some of the things that you've held to be true your whole life may not be so true after all? Are you willing to conduct the experiments yourself with an open mind, without any preconceived notions and be willing to accept the results no matter where they lead? The quest for human knowledge is the quintessential element of being human. It's part of our nature. We're all scientists, and yet it's up to each and every one of us to embark on our own personal journey of self-inquiry. The truth is out there, beyond reason, waiting for us to discover it. Thank you.